Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome. Let us first review some of the conclusions from the last lecture, which is listed in this slide. We went through some of the experiments that showed the presence of hematopoietic stem cell, where we looked at how mice could be irradiated and populated with stem cells that were isolated from the bone marrow. And then we looked at how immune responses were followed in the early experiments by using a plug forming cell assays to quantitate the B cells that were producing the antibodies. And then we went into some experiments to show the role of B cells, T cells and the adherent macrophages basically to say that although B cells were known to make antibodies, it was when they were put together with the T cells and more, more importantly the adherent macrophage populations, only then could they lead to optimal immune responses. And finally, we closed by describing ways by which you can follow T cell activation, because this is necessary to understand the function of macrophages. Now, during this T cell activation description, we saw how the activation of T cells leads to the proliferation of these cells. So, the hallmark of T cell activation being T cell proliferation. And these activated T cells could then be followed by the incorporation of radioactive thymidine into their DNA. So, what we will do first is to try and see what is the principle of this assay that involves T cell activation. So, let us start with the blanks slide. And going on to the next one, if we have T cells in the mixture, these two T cells that are shown in this slide, let us see how they can be activated. Now, the T cell gets activated via the presence of a receptor called as T cell receptor, which is shown here. We will not worry about how the T cell recognizes the antigenic stimulus. Suffice it to stay, say at this present time that the T cell can get activated in response to a stimulus. And so, we will put in something like what you call as a stimulus that has to come from another cell type, basically an antigen presenting cell or macrophage. Now, all this is being done to find out the function of macrophages, because during those times the experiments were evolving to see how macrophage functioned and basically why they had to phagocytose and what they would do after phagocytosing bacteria or bacterial antigens. So, let us see what, what the stimulus from the APC would do. First of all, it has to bind to its receptor and this is done via the T cell receptor and this T cell receptor upon binding to its antigen will transfer a signal into the cell which results in the activation of the IL 2 gene. And therefore, IL 2 mRNA is transcribed from the IL 2 gene and this IL 2 mRNA results in the production of the IL 2, which is also a T cell growth factor. 
being a T cell growth factor, it is secreted outside, outside into the medium and this T cell factor more of it is produced and the T cell factor then goes and binds to its own receptor on a neighboring T cell or for that matter into the same T cell that produce the T cell factor. So, this binding of the T cell factor to its receptor which is also called as the IL 2 receptor then transduces a signal that results in the proliferation of the cell by synthesizing DNA. And the synthesis of DNA can be followed by the incorporation of radioactive thymidine. So, all one does is add tritiated thymidine to the activated T cell preparation, precipitate the DNA by using something like trichloroacetic acid which precipitates all macromolecules. You filter out these macromolecules precipitated molecules and count it in a beta scintillation counter. And therefore, more the radioactive incorporation the more is the T cell activation. So, now coming to this T cell stimulus which is what our aim was to try and see what experiments could demonstrate during those early experiments the function of this these adherent cells which in the last lecture we concluded that adherent cells when mixed with ad, uh, with non adherent cells that contain the B and T cells could lead to a better production of the antibodies and therefore, a better immune response. So, understand the macrophage function or the antigen presenting cell function. Let us try to see what the macrophage done uh, does. It was already known that macrophages could phagocytose thanks to the experiments of Eli Mechnikov and the later experimenters. So, what I have done here is to draw a macrophage here and this function of phagocytosis can also be mediated by cells like neutrophils. So, what do these cells or antigen presenting cells do? So, I have represented here a virus particle that would be found in a virus infected person or for that matter when you are trying to look at immune responses by using an antigen instead of the virus there would be antigens that one would pulse into a cell preparation. So, these, these cell preparations would have of course, this macrophage and if you want to follow the function of these macrophages and if you take took out cells derived from the spleen or other organs which contain lymphocytes, one would have in addition to this macrophage or antigen presenting cell, it would also have the B cells as well as the T cells. So, this virus particle is first taken up by the macrophage by a process of endocytosis or for bigger particles there is phagocytosis bacteria being phagocytosed antigens being endocytosed. Now, the main important thing to bear in mind is that after phagocytosis the antigen whether it is a soluble antigen or a bacteria or for that matter viruses is taken up inside the macrophage and therefore, not available outside. Now, in such a situation if one was to put trypsin, if you used trypsin as a protease, it is a source of a protease and this trypsin has the ability to act on the antigen and cleave it into smaller peptides. This trypsin is able to act on the virus particle or the antigen only if it is available outside of the macrophage. Now, if you take an internalized antigen or a virus preparation, the trypsin cannot enter the cell and therefore, cannot act on this virus particle. So, the experimenters took advantage of this kind of situation to try and see if you put antigen along along with an activated macrophage, how long would the trypsin be, be able to cleave this virus particle. So, the basic experiment would be to see you add antigen outside of the macrophage, allow these antigens to bind to the surface of the macrophage 
and then expose that to trypsin and incubate the macrophage for various periods of time at 37 degrees. Now, phagocytosis needs 37 degrees and when phagocytosis or endocytosis occurs, the virus gets into the macrophage and then so the trypsin would be unable to access that antigen. So, therefore, as you incubate the macrophage at 37 degrees along with the antigen for longer and longer periods of time, more and more of these antigens are getting into the macrophage due to the process of endocytosis and hence unavailable for the action of trypsin. Basically what this antigen presenting cell does also is to clip these antigens into smaller peptides which are available inside the macrophage and later on what would happen to these clipped fragments is what determines the T cell activation. So, let us see what happened in such an experiment that was done by Elner and, and Rosenthal. Elner and Rosenthal in the year 1975. What they basically did was to use macrophages that were isolated or taken from guinea pig. So, they had immunized guinea pigs with the antigens that we spoke of in the previous lectures such as guinea pig albumin or KLH or more importantly for this experiment they used purified protein derivative which was derived from mycobacteria. So, what they did was to take cells from an, a guinea pig that was immunized with this antigen PPD, then isolated the various populations by taking these cells from the peritoneal cavity. So, these are called as peritoneal exudate cells PEC, peritoneal exudate cells. So, what they did was to take the peritoneal exudate cells which was their source of T lymphocytes and then they had also macrophages in that put into that preparation which was the source for as a antigen presenting cells although at that time there was no knowledge about the function of the antigen presenting cell or macrophage. So, going back to the previous slide what they simply did was to add PPD to this macrophage preparation first at 4 degrees so when they added PPD at 4 degrees all the PPD at 4 degrees can bind to the surface of this macrophage we'll put it like this after incubating for some time at 4 degrees during which time phagocytosis cannot occur because it requires energy, they then exposed this incubated macrophage along with the PPD for various periods of time at 37 degrees. So, obviously, when at 37 degrees this peptide would be phagocytosed and therefore, you would have it right within the cell after some time. So, with increasing times this PPD would be found inside the macrophage. So, they exposed this whole mixture in the peritoneal exudate cells which had the T cells which were already activated because the guinea pig were, was immunized to PPD and then looked at the proliferation of these, tel, these T cells when they added these so called pulsed macrophages pulsed because you pulse these macrophages with PPD at 4 degrees for some time and then allow wash, wash the rest of the PPD off. So, there is no PPD except for those that are sticking to the wall to the membranes of the of the cell and then upon transfer to 37 degrees for various periods of time this peptide would be internalized. So, the internalization of the peptide would make it inaccessible to trypsin. Then they would see what would happen to the thymidine incorporation that is being followed by T cell activation which was specific for this antigen PPD. So, when they did that they found that 
at earlier time points because the PPD was still outside the trypsin could act on this and remove that PPD. So, there was no PPD available because of trypsin action soon after 4 degree pulsing. So, at that time what they found was that is at lower times of incubation further incubation 30, 37 degrees they had very little incorporation of the T cells that had to see the antigen. But as time elapsed you found that that in the last slide as 37 degrees this would then go in and therefore, trypsin had no PPD to act on. So, when they when they did this incubation for longer period of time they found that is before the addition of trypsin. So, trypsin could act on that incubated macrophage they found that they got better and better incorporation of thymidine in uh, thymidine into the cells saying that that the incorporation of thymidine increased because of DNA replication in T cell which means it is an indicator of T cell activation. So, therefore, what this meant was that you had this PPD outside at 4 degrees therefore, trypsin acted on it and there was nothing to be internalized, but you allowed that PPD to go in by incubation at 37 degrees before the addition of trypsin out to outside the macrophage. You found that trypsin had as time elapsed there was much less of PPD outside that was available for trypsin action. And what it also meant was that this processing of the PPD inside the macrophage somehow led to the recognition that T cells would come would T cells would recognize the macrophage that was processing these antigens which also meant that since the T cell could only recognize antigen on the cell surface it also meant that these antigens had to come out some way on the cell surface. So, that is the property of T cell recognition and how the T cell recognizes is of course, will come into the next slide. So, what they learned basically from this experiment was that the macrophage would internalize the antigen and the internalization then is followed by a certain kind of a processing of this antigen because larger virus particles had to be degraded to smaller uh, sizes and this processed antigen would then be shuttled onto the cell surface which would then be available for the T cell to see via its T cell receptor. So, what is the nature of this interaction between the T cell and the macrophage? So, this was the first indication that came that the macrophage the requirement for adherent cells vis a vis the macrophages was because the macrophage had to take up the antigen and process the antigen in some way which they did not know at that time except to say that macrophage contained lysozyme or uh, I am sorry lysosomes which were acidic in pH. So, they used some blocking agent by increasing the pH of the lysosomes by using ammonium chloride and lo and behold the T cell activation was blocked. So, this process was blocked when you added to the macrophage you added ammonium chloride or incubated the macrophage with ammonium chloride before the addition of the antigen PPD. There are other lysosomotropic compounds like for example, chloroquine which all of you are known for its use in, in, uh, in malaria. This chloroquine is also lysosomotropic because it goes to the lysosomes and alters the pH inside the lysosomes. The chloro treatment of the macrophages with chloroquine before pulsing them with the antigen also block this T cell activation. So, they knew from these experiments that the acidic pH or the low pH of the lysosomes was required for the macrophage for its function. So, in retrospect of course, if you were to look at all these things uh, to how macrophage function we now know of course, there are two types of presentation one presentation which takes up the soluble antigen that is available to the available to the macrophage 
So, you have extracellular protein, soluble protein or for that matter bacteria which is taken up by the macrophage and the macrophage these antigens that are taken up in the macrophage are clipped up in the endosomes and then you have these compartments playing a very important role in how these molecules or peptides are loaded onto structures called as MHC molecules or major histocompatibility molecules and then brought out on the cell surface. As opposed to soluble antigens, you had to you have to think about immune responses to viruses that are not available outside. For example, retrovirus characteristic example being AIDS virus, you have the virus going inside and replicating inside. So, how does an immune cell deal with uh, a pathogen that has entered the cell? So, there is another pathway of uh, antigen presentation which is called as the class 1 presentation because the antigen arises endogenously and it is not taken up from outside which is exogenous antigen presentation. The endogenous antigen presentation also involves clipping of the antigen into smaller peptides and presentation along with a different type of class MHC molecule called as the class 1. All these uh, aspects of presentation will be taken up during the antigen presentation lectures. Now, again to summarize T cell function or CD4 T cell function is nothing but T helper cell proliferation. So, what happens there is that the T cell receptor has got two, two subunits which is uh, the T cell receptor has got uh, I am sorry to say T cell receptor actually has several subunits, but the main functioning receptor has got two subunits which interacts with the MHC molecule which is now presenting this peptide shown to you in red. So, the green is the MHC class 2 molecule which holds up this peptide inside of it like a bouquet and this bouquet is what is recognized by the antigen recognition portion of the T cell receptor. Now, in response to this recognition the T cell gets activated and spews out lymphokines and these lymphokines are the ones that play a major role in giving B cell help and various other functions of cytokines will be discussed in the cytokine class. So, basically then you have all these cells functioning in a in a cooperative way and basically just to summarize for you, you have of course, the antigen that is arising from the pathogen and by various other processes in the body. This antigen stimulates the macrophage or is taken up by the macrophage processed inside the macrophage into smaller peptides, which then upon interaction with the T cell stimulates the T cell to secrete cytokines. One of the major cytokines being interleukin 2, which helps in the proliferation of not only T cells, but B cells as well. So, other cytokines help the B cells to make the different classes of antibody. So, therefore, antigen taken up by the macrophage which stimulates the T cell help T cell to give cytokines or give T cell help upon T cell macrophage or antigen presenting cell interaction, which then interacts with the B cell the T cells interact with the B cells in order to produce antibodies and therefore, their function. As opposed to stimulation the immune system also has various regulatory pathways the antigen by itself and the antibody also in a in a variety of complex processes can feedback regulate this stimulation of the immune system in the event that it gets stimulated uh, uh, very much and goes beyond what is required for an optimal immune response. So, these regulatory mechanisms include what are called as generation or differentiation of regulatory T cells which will be dealt with in, in future classes. So, this is the summary of, of how the antigen is recognized and results in the final T cell activation via the macrophage. So, let us go on then further after having learnt about the cells of the immune system. Although there are so many complex things that are 
performed in a very optimal way, the immune system has its own abnormalities or immunodeficiencies or disorders. So, going into some of these disorders of the immune system or immune deficiencies, I have given to I have given here some of the, the pathway by which these stem cells differentiate into the lymphoid and, and myeloid precursors, which we went to in the in the in the previous class. And at what steps these various infect, uh, immunodeficient diseases affect this differentiative pathway. So, we all know now that stem cells via their precursors can finally, differentiate into T lymphocytes or plasma cells or B from B cells. So, let us look at what are the diseases that affect stem cells. So, you have diseases that affect stem cells called as reticular dysgenesis. Now, what is reticular dysgenesis? So, if you are to look at what reticular dysgenesis does is it is characterized by an absence of all T and B cells. Granulocytes and monocytes are absent, but erythrocytes and thrombocytes are present and children die soon after birth because of the absence of all T and B cells. Now, going back to this particular diagram, you also have other diseases which affect the primary lymphoid organs like the thymus and the bursa or for that matter the synthesis or differentiation of pre B cells and pre T cells. So, if you look at the thymus, there is this deficiency called as the D Georgi syndrome. This D Georgi syndrome is a congenital thymic aplasia. Aplasia means the thymic is not fully functional. So, you have the absence of the thymus, it is actually due to a developmental defect which is caused by a deletion in chromosome number 22. All these patients have abnormal uh, facial abnormalities, they have hypoparathyroidism and congenital heart disease. Some of the photographs of these patients can be seen in, in popular textbooks like uh, Kubi immunology. Then you have what you call as the Nezeloff syndrome, I am sorry this, this has to be this has to be Z, Nezeloff syndrome there is a typing error over here. So, Nezeloff syndrome is characterized by also hypoplasia, thymic hypoplasia and while the D Dodgy syndrome is a developmental defect, this is an inherited disorder. So, going back to this tree, you let us see what happens in the immunodeficiency that affects the bursal environment or for that matter the pre B, T, uh, three pre B cell. So, if you are to look at this, you have what is called as Bruton, Bruton's uh, uh, X linked A glamour uh, globulinemia. So, here the IgG levels are low and the defect stems from basically a defect in BTK or Bruton's tyrosine kinase. There is a maturation block in pre B cells and patients 6 months after birth, they, they come down with pneumococcal and streptococcal infections. Until then the maternal IgG protects the newborn. They have a normal response to viruses and fungi and to certain extent they are treatable with IgG infections. So, having done looked at the immunodeficiencies that affect the stem cell, thymus and the bursal environment. You have some of the very uh, common uh, immunodeficiencies such as severe immunodeficiency syndrome or severe combined immunodeficiency disease. So, in skids, the, this is a family or a group of de, group of immunodeficiencies. If you look at what are the different kinds of immunodeficiencies in um, severe combined immunodeficiency disease or skids. They are usually autosomal recessive, some of them are X linked, they are characterized by low numbers of lymphocytes, but other cells are normal. The thymus does not develop very well and T cell responses are deficient. There are several types of this of these skid diseases and one of them has to do with 
with the absence or mutations in the IL 2 receptor gamma chain. The IL 2 receptor has three chains and the gamma chain is shared between other lymphokines such as IL 4, IL 7, IL 9 and IL 15. So, therefore, this mutation in the IL 2 receptor causes a deficiency in the function of IL 4, IL 7, IL 9 and 15 therefore, leading to several abnormalities immune cell function which we will look at uh, when we see how cytokines all these various cytokines such as IL 4 and IL 7 function. In addition to mutation in IL 2 receptor gamma chain, there is a skid or, or diseases where JAK 3 or Janus kinase 3 is affected. In addition to that, the TCR associated protein called as ZAP 70 is also deficient in function leading to a deficiency in T cell function. So, as you can see there are several types of skid diseases and then in addition to that of course, you have other things called as skid with adenosine deaminase deficiency or ADA deficiency. So, they, they also share that uh, the condition where the numbers of lymphocytes are abnormal. Here mainly the conversion of adenosine to enosine is blocked. As a result several toxic chemicals accumulate within the cell and therefore, leads to the non development of the cells which need the adenosine or deaminase and that is found this gene is found in chromosome 20 and many of these deficiencies are found in Kalahari tribes and in Arabian horses for some reason. In addition to adenosine deaminase deficiency, you have skid with purine nucleoside phosphorylase deficiency or PNP deficiency. There also toxic metabolites um, accumulate and the onset occurs between 2 and 4 years of age and this particular uh, gene is found in chromosome 14. So, another type of skid or uh, deficient lymphocyte function comes from what you call as the bare lymphocyte syndrome which is due to the absence of class 2 or MHC molecule the type 2 uh, MHC molecule on the expressed on the surface of various kinds of uh, T cells and this is because of a deficient promoter um, that that uh, helps in this in the transcription of the uh, gene. So, going back to the tree you find that we have covered the PNP deficiency the bare lymphocyte syndrome which affects the T cells and of course, all these the Bruton's disease and then let us look at other kinds of diseases that affect the B cells which is called as the Viscott Aldrich syndrome and let us see what, what sort of deficiencies affect the B cells or the B cell pathway. So, here you find that the uh, Viscott Aldrich syndrome is actually a, a, the blockage in T cell uh, differentiation. It results in reduction in platelet and neutrophils, but there is an increase in eosinophils and normal IgG levels predominate, but the class distribution of IgGs is skewed. You will come to know more about the various classes and subclasses of immunoglobulins. Suffice it to say that IgM is low, but IgA and IgE levels are higher. This is an X-linked disorder and patients do not survive after the first decade of life. The mutations that affect the syndrome or results in this syndrome is basically in a cytoskeletal glycoprotein which is called a siloforin C D 42. Now, C D 42 stands for cluster of differentiation. Now, the other T cell defect is also called as the common variable immunodeficiency which is also called as C V I it is has an onset few months to several years after birth and is characterized by reduced serum gamma globulins because of reduced T cell help. It can be controlled by immunoglobulin IgG diffusion it is primarily a T cell uh, lesion and B cells do not develop into plasma cells because of T cell lesions. So, going back to the tree we have covered the Viscott Aldrich syndrome as well as the other diseases. Now, let us come to the other diseases which affect uh, uh, the B cells like the X linked hyper IgM syndrome or the common 
variable hypoglobulinemia. Now, here I think I have done a mistake in the let us go back and see what happens to okay, this B cell X linked hyper IgM syndrome, which was not expanded upon by a, uh, by a link. The hyper IgM syndrome results in more of IgM in some of these diseases. This is also X linked disorder. So, let us go into some of these things. Yes, there you are. This is the B cell defects, which is the Bruton's X linked. Uh, a gamma globulinia which I described to you just a little earlier. You have syndromes where you have selective IgA deficiency or selective IgM deficiency where you have IgG and IgM predominating in mucosal surfaces because IgA as I told you predominates in, in the malt tissue or mucosal associated lymphoid tissues. This actually predomination of IgG and IgM in some patients leads to infection of paranasal sinuses, the pulmonary airways and leads to some autoimmune problems. Of course, these problems are not predominating in all in all patients of this particular syndrome. Now, going on to IgM deficiencies, these patients are very much susceptible to pneumococci and meningococci infections, but otherwise they are normal and the T cells are normal in this particular deficiency. Now, as I told you the X linked hyper IgM syndrome, where the IgM is elevated, but the other subclasses IgA, IgG and IgA are deficient actually leads to autoantibodies to neutrophils, platelets as well as erythrocytes. The defect is actually due to the CD40 ligand gene in T helper cells and leads to lower B cell response. So, going back to the tree, now having covered the lymphocyte lineage, we will try we will see what are the diseases that are associated with the myeloid pathway. So, the myeloid pathway is affected by disease such as the Shediac Higashi disease, the leukocyte adhesion deficiency which affects the neutrophils or the polymorphs and also the chronic granulomatous disease. So, going to this, these de deficiency diseases, the myeloid lineage defects such as the chronic granulomatous disease of the CGD, which is, which is an X linked disorder in 70 percent of the patients, while some patients also have the autosomal recessive form. The phagocyte ability to kill bacteria in these patients is very much defective to due to the defects in hydrogen peroxide generation, because one of the mechanisms by which phagocyte kill or lyse bacteria is by the production of hydrogen peroxide as well as superoxide radicals. So, they are defective in hydrogen peroxide generation due to the presence of a defective phagocyte oxidase enzyme as well as cytochrome B558 which are involved in the production of these various radicals. This of course, as I told you in the earlier classes is part of the innate immunity. Now, this also leads to a coincident defective antigen presentation by the monocytes from these patients. Now, in such patients the therapeutics involving the infusion of gamma interferon has helped in the activation of these phagocytes. So, perhaps some of these patients have benefited from ongoing studies wherein you can actually use gamma interferon for therapy. In addition to CGD, you have what is called as the Shediac Higashi disease, which affects the myeloid lineage, where the phagocytes contain giant granules. You know, gr these granules also contain various ch chemicals, enzymes, proteins that are helpful in lysing bacteria these granules are bigger in size, they are giant in size, but they cannot kill bacteria. So, the ability to kill bacteria phagocytes from these patients is very much compromised. This is actually due to a mutation in protein trafficking, due to a mutation in what a protein called as LYST. Now, the function of this protein is actually to target various kinds of proteins to lysosomes for mediating degradation of proteins and you know degradation of proteins is involved in antigen presentation. 
Now, going on to leukocyte adhesion deficiency or lab, they have deficient expression of integrins. Integrins are adhesion molecules which we will come to in the next lecture or perhaps in the same lecture. Now, these integrins are expressed on the surface of lymphocytes as well as other kinds of cells which help in the mediation of cell surface adhesion. You, you might remember some of the uh, one slide that I showed you in the first class where I showed you how the cells migrate out from the capillaries through the vas vascular endothelial cell junctions because they have they are undergoing chemotaxis in response to a chemotactic factor that is released from the cell wall of bacterial infect bacterially infected sites. So, these integrins they play a very important role in these adhesive uh, adhesive roles uh, or adhesive reactions that are taking place between cells between the cells themselves as well as between the cells and the capillaries vascular endothelial cells in the capillaries. So, these some of these integrin molecules or proteins are called as C D 11 A or L F A 1 which was pre it was previously known as or lymphocyte function associated one molecule because this is a one L F A 1 because there are other L F A such as L F A 2, 3 and so on. So, the C D 11 B is another molecule that is affected in this particular deficiency it is also called as a MAC 1 antigen and the C D 11 C is also called as GP 150 or GP 95. Now, the this all these expressions are actually due the deficiency in the expression of these integrins are due to the mutation in the C D 18 or the common beta chain that they share between themselves. In in all these lymphocyte interactions and in immune responses you will come across a variety of molecules especially cytokines that, that share various kinds of protein subunits. So, they are called as alpha, beta, gamma. So, you will see certain receptors sharing the gamma chain as you saw in the case of the IL 2 receptor and in certain other cases like these integrins share a different kind of protein subunits. So, different kinds of integrins share common subunits. So, if the common subunit is absent the expression on the cell surface of these integrins are blocked and therefore, the functions that are associated with these integrin molecules like adhesion reactions are also blocked. So, therefore, it this impaired adhesion of leukocytes neutrophils and so on and so forth to the vascular endothelial cells is blocked and leads actually to the susceptibility to gram positive and gram negative bacteria as well as fungi. So, this deficiency actually see uh, leads to a life expectancy of a lowered nature like just a few years or up to 40 years. So, you have now seen all the different kinds of immunodeficiencies that are associated with this lymphos, lymph, uh, lymphoid lineage differentiation pathway. We have covered some of the main immunodeficiencies, but there are other kinds of deficiencies that you can see in popular textbooks. Some of them include ataxia, telangiectasia, which is uh, due to uh, the, uh, the deficient uh, kinases. Uh, that are associated uh, with this disease. And there are several other diseases which you will see in various other popular, uh, popular textbooks, but suffice it to say that these are the main immunodeficient diseases that can be covered to see in what steps that they that they affect in the pathway which is shown by these arrows. So, so far we have now covered up to now how the hematopoietic stem cell differentiated into these various kinds of uh, T lymphocyte, the B lymphocytes as well as the monocytes or the differentiated macrophages and the associated immunodeficiencies. Then we have covered some experiments that demonstrated at that time how a hematopoietic stem cell could give rise to all the different kinds of uh, cells. Uh, in the immune system using the, the or referring to the Till and Mekalov uh, experiment using irradiated uh, recipient mice. Then we went into how experiments showed the presence of the B cells, the importance of the bursa and the bone marrow as well as the importance of the thymus or the uh, thymus derived T cells and the experiments that were done to show 
uh, how, how the T cells uh, were shown not to produce or not being involved in antibody production, but the B cell was more important antibody production. And of course, the more important contribution uh, by the presence or the function of macrophages and the consequent antigen presentation and the experiment that was done with uh, pulsed mac uh, PPD pulsed macrophages uh, derived from uh, guinea pigs and how the T cell activation occurs. So, having seen all these things about the cells of the immune system, now we see how these cells are actually organized within the body. Now, various kinds of parallel uh, kinds of comparisons can be made between the immune system and the immune uh, or the defensive forces of, of a particular nation. You know just like you say immune function which, uh, which recognizes self from non-self and also the defense forces have to recognize the difference between the national citizens and, and the aggressor. Similarly, the immune cells also di differentiates or is able to make out the presence of the, uh, the aggressor or uh, like danger present, uh, distinguish danger from non-danger as well as what are called as pathogen recognition molecules which we will come to in the, in the lecture on innate immunity. So, how are these cells organized? Now, a, a comparison can be made to a nation which is at war. Now, when a, when a nation is at war, there have to be mechanisms by which they transport troops from where they are normally present to the active uh, war zone, which need not necessarily be at, uh, at a zone that is normally occupying the forces at, at peacetime. So, all these troops are organized by organizing various kinds of uh, railway uh, procedures where the trains are dedicated to transport troops to uh, the border. Similarly, in the, lymph in the immune system, the antigen or the bacterial infection can come in any place in the body and the lymphocytes that are circulating in the blood have to come out from the blood vessel in the place of uh, aggression or in the place of the lesion. So, how are these done and what sort of what sort of mechanisms are employed by the immune system in order to orchestrate this kind of immune responses. And for that we go into our next series of lectures which includes the organs of the immune system. So, as I told you in the earlier class there are different organs of the immune system classified as primary lymphoid organs which includes the thymus and the bone marrow and you have what are called as secondary lymphoid organs because they play a secondary function and are not basically involved in the differentiation into T, T lymphocytes from precursors or the differentiation of B cells from B cell precursors. Now, these secondary lymphoid organs are the ones that play a very important role in detecting the antigen. So, the mature lymphocytes all, all go into these secondary lymphoid organs and it is at in those locations that the antigen is actually detected. So, what are these secondary lymphoid organs? So, you will see that these secondary lymphoid organs are described in your books as lymph nodes or the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue which I alluded to in the previous class which is mainly uh, connected with the mucosal surfaces as well as certain lymph nodes that are associated with the gut this is called as the gut associated lymphoid tissue. Remember even the gut is the gut is actually the gut is one of the very important locations which is constantly bombarded with uh, microorganisms or pathogens or other kinds of bacteria and, and viruses because the food that we in, that we eat all, always contains some sort of bacteria or the other whether it is pathogenic or non pathogenic depends upon how they get across across the intestine. So, the gut is constantly dealing or bombarded with these kind of bacteria that is derived from the food that we eat and yet the body is not being infected all the time. So, the gut associated lymphoid tissue has a very important and a very unique way of blocking this these kinds of pathogens. So, looking at all these secondary lymphoid organs we need to we need to uh, learn how these secondary lymphoid organs actually function. 
Now, when you look at how the antigen infection or the pathogenic infection occurs, we need to look at what sort of these um, different kinds of lymph nodes that are present. If you were to open a mouse, you will see that there are so many, so many of these lymphoids, uh, uh, lymph nodes or secondary lymphoid organs. So, as you will see here, they are all called by different names. Suffice it to show you that a particular uh, mammalian body contains uh, an array of different um, aggregation of different lymphoid uh, tissues or, or lymph nodes that are found in different places in the body. Like for example, these mesenteric lymph nodes are just uh, found attached to the peritoneum of the intestine. And then you have of course, the payas patches within the intestine itself in order to uh, encounter the incoming bacteria from the food that we eat. And then of course, you have all these different kinds of lymph nodes that are found under the arm and under the neck and so on and so forth, which is also present even in the humans. So, just to just to uh, see that you know under the armpit you have axillary nodes and then of course, you have the thymus be, just below the sternum. And then you have the cervical nodes, the thymus being a primary organ and all these different kinds of nodes being secondary lymphoid organ and one of the major secondary lymphoid organ is the spleen. So, in order to understand the function of these lymph nodes which are very much distributed all over our bodies, we need to understand the, the structure of the lymph node. Although we would not like to go into the anatomical structure of these uh, secondary lymphoid organs which is uh, which which you will find very well described in various kinds of textbooks. The effort that we will put in in these classes is to understand basically what these secondary lymphoid organs do in respect or with respect to how the antigen is perceived. Now, to understand the lymph node the role of the lymph node in Im immune responses we need to recognize that in addition to the systemic circulation or the circulation of your blood within the body through the heart. Basically to say you send in oxygenated blood from uh, these ventricles and then you get this oxygenated blood losing its oxygen or giving up its oxygen to various tissue cells and then getting the deoxygenated or the oxygen depleted blood back into the heart. So, what happens in, in these situations is that in addition to this systemic circulation, we also have to recognize the presence of what is called as the lymphatic circulation. Because the lymphatic circulation is a circulation that involves the fluid that drains the various tissue spaces. For example, if you were to have a kind of a redness in your skin and a small sort of a, a patch that develops and irritation that develops over there, there is edema of fluid. Now, where, where, where is all this fluid coming from and how does it come from and how does it and where does it go. So, during such situations or even under normal situations the fluid that drains the various kinds of tissue masses or tissue cells is actually being drained into certain, certain uh, kind of paths and this path when they all accumulate and make a sufficient kind of, uh, of a fluid is called as the is the flows in a, in a in a duct called as the thoracic duct. So, this is the lymphatic circulation. So, the thoracic duct contains all these drained tissue fluids. These tissue fluids if there is an infection will carry that infectious organism or the toxin that comes from it and this is actually circulated by these various kind of lymph nodes. Now, these lymph nodes also have some of the some, some property of contraction. So, these contractions actually actually you know let the fluid go from one lymph node to another and finally, it em empties out into the heart via these veins. So, then of course, the heart takes care of how the, uh, the, the blood is the de oxygen depleted blood is pumped into the lung. And then of course, you have the exchange of oxygen into the hemoglobin and then it comes back into the heart where the iota then is, ta is taking the oxygen and it bleed and complete oxygenated blood and completes the circulation. <coughs> so, all the tissue flu all the tissue spaces have these fluids which collect this antigen and drains them into this thoracic duct. So, that is how these antigens actually come into the circulation in addition to being in the systemic circulation. 
Now, if you were to look at the structure of a lymph node, you will see that it contains a kind of a capsular structure just like way many other um, uh, secondary lymphoid organs. So, it has a capsule on the outside and inside we call it as the medulla. So, the main thing that we need to uh, uh, recognize before we end this class since the time is becoming short, this capsule has got entrance points like you see over here either vessels that are coming from the thoracic duct or from various other kinds of uh, spaces. These are called as the afferent lymphatic ducts. The afferent lymphatic duct take the lymphatic fluid and let it come and drain into this lymph node. So, the actual lymphatic duct or the lymphatic fluid that contains the antigen during infection of some tissue space contains the antigen and comes within and into the lymph node in this fashion. Now, within the within the lymph node you have various kinds of structures and we are not going to the actual details of anatomical structure just with respect to the immunological aspects you have B cell areas where B cells have congregated and then of course, you have the T cell areas or what you call as the paracortex which contains T cells and of course, your antigen presenting cells that are present in this entire lymph node. So, all the three cell types are available in this organized kind of a tissue where you can have them interacting with each other and giving rise to the optimal uh, amounts of lymphokines in order to encounter and react to the antigen that is being drained in from the afferent lymphatics. So, there are two kinds of structures over here what is called as the primary follicle and a secondary follicle. A primary follicle contains a follicle which is ready to encounter the antigen and contains B cells that are mature whereas, a secondary, a secondary follicle contains B cells that have got activated by virtue of interacting with T cells and seeing the antigen and contains what is called as a germinal center along with the dividing and lymphocytes that surround it. So, we will leave, leave it at this point and tell you more about the lymph, the lymph node structure in the next class. So, we will, we will end this lecture and uh, and summarize the things that we have done or learned today was to look at how the antigen presenting cells present antigen and this presentation of antigens are detected by T cell activation and how all these various types of cells congregate in certain structures called as the lymph nodes and we will get into the role of secondary lymphoid organs in the next class. Thank you very much.